Bueno, muchas gracias por acompañarnos a esta sesión de nuestro seminario de investigadores del Instituto. Y en esta ocasión nos dará mucho gusto compartirla con un evento de Sweet Humanity México, que consistirá en la conferencia de la doctora Rita Alfredo. Ah, antes de presentarla, me gustaría ceder la palabra a Diana Romero, que es la fundadora de Sweet Analytic, quien nos dirige más palabras sobre eh, la organización y algunos cambios y novedades. Gracias, Diana. Gracias, Tere. Eh, y gracias a todos por estar aquí en este evento compartido. Soy Panalytic México y señor de, de investigadores de la, del Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas. Eh, es un placer, como dice Tere, tener aquí a la doctora Itala Alfredo. Y este es nuestro primer evento del tercer año de, de operación de Soy Panalytic México. Eh, van a ver algunos cambios, como comentó Tere. En primer lugar, yo quisiera hacer un agradecimiento a la doctora Maite Escudia, quien acaba de fallecer recientemente, por ser representante del proyecto Sweep Analytic México en el Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas y creer en nosotros. Eh, Maite impulsó desde el inicio este proyecto, creyó en él, y bueno, yo estoy profundamente agradecida por eso, siempre va a estar no solo en nuestro corazón, pero también como un ejemplo eh, pues a seguir, como una de las filósofas más grandes de México. Eh, bueno, otra cosa que quiero decir es, bueno, yo me formé aquí en la UNAM, fui estudiante asociado aquí en el Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas y una manera de retribuir por todo el apoyo que recibí y la formación que recibí fue dedicar tiempo, dos años, a este proyecto, fundarlo, dirigirlo por dos años y pues echarlo a andar. Eh, quiero pues también agradecer a Pedro Estepanenco por la oportunidad eh, que me dio y por creer también en mí. Eh, bueno, pues ahora lo que me queda es eh, dos cosas. Una, decir que Tere Rodríguez ha estado al pie del cañón en este proyecto. Yo estoy sumamente agradecida con ella. Y eh, bueno, ella continuará apoyando en la organización. Yo quiero entregar la batuta del de este proyecto a, en codirección a la doctora Tocha Liceda y a la doctora María Elena García Peláez de la Universidad Panamericana para que continúen este proyecto y esperamos que otros, otro periodo, un segundo periodo de tres años pueda continuar. Eh, y finalmente, eh, pues más importante aquí, eh, ante la, obviamente la falta de, de Maite, quien ha sido una figura pues, importante para todos nosotros, eh, pues queremos eh, dejar, nombrar a alguien también muy especial para nosotros, para el proyecto y para toda la academia, como representante del Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas para Swim Analytic, a la doctora Olbet Hansberg, quien ha sido también un, un ejemplo importante para todos nosotros, para mí en particular, y eh, pues creemos que ella puede también continuar la representación aquí en el Instituto en en nombre de, de Maite. Gracias, Olbeck, por aceptarlo. Gracias a Tocha también por continuar este proyecto. A todos ustedes por la difusión, por estar ahí. Y pues especialmente también a Tere por acompañarme en, en este camino. Gracias. Bueno, ahora eh, me gustaría presentar brevemente a la doctora ella es profesora titular eh, de Lógica y Fundamentos de Matemáticas en la Universidad Estatal de Campinas, eh, donde hizo su doctorado en 1982 bajo la dirección de Newton da Costa. Realizó estancias postdoctorales en las universidades de California, Stanford y Oxford, y es la primera mujer latinoamericana electa para la Academia Internacional de Filosofía de las Ciencias. Pertenece además a la Academia Mexicana de Lógica y recibió el premio a esta gira por sus investigaciones en lógica en la ciudad de Morelia. Muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Vamos a escuchar tu conferencia, después tenemos nuestro break y regresamos a la sesión de preguntas. ¿Dónde está lo que hace? Buenos días, no voy a hablar acá porque tengo que movimentarme, no, no, no me gusta estar cortado acá. Uh, quiero uh, agradecer a, 
alla SWIP, all'Istituto di Investigazioni Filosofiche della UNAM e anche alla dottora, professore mia amica Atocha Liceda per l'invitazione. È sempre una allegria e un piacere stare in Mexico. Mi sento un po' mexicana da hace años. Y eh, con mucho gusto acepté venir. Hoy voy a hablar eh, sobre un tema que, eh, que hemos investigado hace 15 años. Después de, de 13 años publicamos un libro que voy presentarle, que pretendo a present presentarles al fin de la conferencia. Y eh, seguimos con la investigación. Eh, es una investigación original en la literatura y tenemos también la participación en el libro en inglés de, de colaboradores acá de México y mencionaron que, que soy la primera mujer latinoamericana elegida por la Academia Internacional de Filosofía y la Ciencia y quería decirles que Atocha Liceda fue elegida en, en, en el semestre anterior en el año de 2018, como la otra mujer latinoamericana en la academia. Y entonces es con mucho gusto que somos compañeras de academia también. Uh, mis slides fueron preparados en inglés. Mañana están en, en español y voy a hablar en español, pero Atocha me dijo que podía hablar en inglés acá, en esta. Pero si tienen problema en pregunta, no hablo bien en español, pero como decimos, puedo hablar en portugués, como decimos en América Latina. Y, y entonces las cuestiones después podemos hacerlas y contestarlas en, en español, en portugués. ¿Está bien? Muy bien, Ita. Muchas gracias, Inés, más por la invitación. Excelente. Yo creo que funciona tu uh, control, pero si no, te he cambiado la computadora. Ah, sí. sí. Y entonces, como, como les decía, eh, empezamos la. Voy a hablar una hora de 10 más o menos, por 50 minutos de este. Y ya tengo que estar aquí para que sepa cómo terminar. La, la investigación empezó hace años cuando un estudiante de doctorado me propuso un trabajo sobre la historia de la lógica para consistente. Pero empezamos con una investigación histórica sobre la presencia de la paraconsistencia en la historia del pensamiento occidental. Y entonces se cambió el proyecto. La historia de la lógica para consistencia es algo que ya hay trabajo en la literatura. Y, y, y vimos que, que la investigación estaba muy interesante eh, cuando tratamos de encontrar. Eh, cuestiones relacionadas posiblemente a la paraconsistencia contemporánea en pensadores de la antigüedad, en especial del periodo medieval. Y ahí la investigación se cambió y, y, y eh, se tornó una investigación sobre la historia de la paraconsistencia. Eh, Hablo en inglés, entonces. Yo soy okay. uh, The present state of our consistent logic attests to significant development and its maturity permits a critical historical analysis of its development, having in view the appreciation of its historical roots and stages of formation. Our work attempts to discover how a truly but a consistent perspective is constituted, as well as how logical principles, rules, and systems have expressed the various concepts of our consistency. In this way, we may ask ourselves if logical principles and rules according to which not everything may be deduced from a contradiction or something may be rejected, were conceived and evoked within certain contexts and theoretical traditions. In some, in, uh, in, in one of the slides, posteriores, voy a decir lo que significa eso que hablé. 
The study of the logical meaning of consistency and inconsistency is found throughout the various periods of the history of philosophy, science, and logic. Diverse authors have investigated the phenomena of contradiction, seeking to identify, understand, and neutralize its consequences for rational knowledge. Analyzing the historical precedents of a consistent logic before the 20th century, we can identify some unanswered questions. Which questions? We will try to, to, to show you. What ideas were proposed and debated with regard to consistency in that period of the history of formal logic? Did such ideas influence later logical theories? Was their knowledge of logical rules and principles which allowed in some contests for inconsistency to be dealt without trivialization? If such principles were known, how were these proto-principles stated and in what way can they be related to the logical by consistent results and rules known today? Let's recall. A logic is consistent if there is no form, it's not written there, if there is no formula of its language, no formula A, such that A and the negation of A are theorems. You know this very well. Uh, so, we must have a language with a, a negation, and there is no formula A such A and not A is a theorem or is provable. Uh, in this case, the logic is consistent. Otherwise, the logic is inconsistent. But a logic or a theory are trivial <coughs> if every formula of its language is provable. That means if everything, every statement is a theorem. There is no interest for science, not even for philosophy, to deal uh, in dealing with trivial theories, because everything is valid, is true, is provable. Okay. The basic laws of, no, sorry, a logic is per consistent if it can be used as the underlying logic to inconsistent but non-trivial theories, which are called per-consistent theories. Uh, so, a logic is per-consistent if it can be used como la lógica subjacente a teorías inconsistentes pero no triviales. Quiere decir, teorías en las cuales es posible la demostración de una fórmula y de su negación, pero teorías en las cuales eso no implique la trivialidad de la teoría. Las teorías basadas en las lógicas para consistentes son dichas, son llamadas teorías para consistentes. Uh, las leyes básicas del pen... Uh, the basic laws of the Aristotelian thought, very well known, are three. The law... Ah, no se puede... Okay. The law of non-contradiction, also known as the law of contradiction. The law says that it's not a case of A and not E. The principle of the excluded middle, the ejercerio excluido, que dice A o no A, A o not A, and the law of reflexivity of identity for every X, X is equal to X. The identity law. A well known principle called since the medieval times, the ex falso sequitur quadrilibet, also known as ex impossibile sequitur quadrilibet, nowadays called principle of explosion, principio de explosion, 
es eso. A implica, no A implica B, que también puede ser escrito como A y no A implica B. ¿Qué quiere decir ese principio? Que de una contradicción sigue cualquiera que sea la fórmula. Si tengo A y de A tengo no A, entonces tengo B cualquiera. No, paramos acá. ¿Cuál es el problema de la negación y de la contradicción? Si trabajamos con teorías basadas, fundadas en la lógica clásica. Perdón, no sé en qué lengua hablamos. Si en tu lengua, con teorías basadas, fundadas en la lógica clásica, esta ley es una teoría. Si tenemos una teoría o una lógica en la que estos tres Aristotelian principios son válidos, We can prove as a general theorem of the logic this principle. And so, if we are dealing with theories based on classical logic, on account of this principle, if we have one contradiction, it's not necessary to have two. If we have one formula such that A and not A are provable, we can prove any B whatsoever. And so the problem of contradiction. If we have one contradiction, we have triviality. If we are dealing with theories based on classical logic, it's necessary only one contradiction in order to have explosion. Aristotle has never mentioned in his works this law. We could Nobody knew that. But we tried to, 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 to find this in the Aristotelian texts, but it doesn't appear. Aristotle called our attention, saying that the most important of the principles for rationality is non-contradiction. He didn't mention the explosion principle, but it seems that he knew the danger of one contradiction when he called attention for the importance of non contradiction. Okay, and so, if you are dealing with theories based on classical logic, we can't have one contradiction, because we have explosion. Because this formula is provable in classical logic based on the three Aristotelian laws. Okay, let's go to Logical but consistent elements in ancient authors. We began with Heraclitus of Ephesus, and each in their own way, the contributions of Heraclitus, Heraclitus of Ephesus and Parmenides of Elea are decisive for the later development of logic, particularly for having dealt with the question of inconsistency and consistency, and for having, in a certain way, <coughs> placed the issue on the agenda of later philosophy, especially in the treatment of the theme by Plato and Aristotle. Heraclitus writing a second century before Christ, are known to us only through fragments, which explain his theory of the harmony of opposites and are particularly important for the discussion of the annulment of the principle of non-contradiction attributed by Aristotle to Heraclitus and for their influence on later discussion in ancient logic. The theory of the harmony of opposites is in need of an interpretation which is more natural and in which the identity of opposites does not need to be denied. In general, the authors who have studied and analyzed it, analyzed it, the, the Heraclitus theory, they try to adapt the, uh, the presence of opposites according to the classical canon. But we claim that we have to, uh, to deal with the theories from another point of view. 
Heraclitus' ideas provoked a debate on the study of contradiction in rational knowledge and in logic. In relation to the history of persistent logic, we may conclude that the ideas of Heraclitus can be seen as a rational system of explanation which, if formalized, can describe contradictory states without, at the same time, trivializing itself. Paradoxically, in our work, it's thanks to Parmenides' contributions to classical logic that he is included in our work. His thought is known to us through fragments of the poem on nature, where some may be interpreted as a proto-enunciation of the three fundamental canons of classical deductive axiomatic thought. In fact, we can attribute to Parmenides the three Aristotelian laws, even Aristotle agrees with that in his work. Although the philosophical activity of Plato, in one way or another, <laughs> took into account clearly logical schemes of inference, one cannot affirm that he studied logic for its own sake, as an autonomous form of knowledge. But the contributions of Aristotle in the fourth century before Christ to the founding of logic and of scientific method have been amply celebrated. We argue that in the core of his theory of syllogy, he describes some deductive schemes in which the presence of inconsistencies does not imply the trivialization of the logical theory involved. Though not explicit, the notion that Aristotle proposed results of a consistent character is corroborated for various theoretical situations he examined. In the prior analytics or prior analytics, pure analytica, he explains how valid syllogisms based on opposite, contrary or contradictory premises can be obtained. Aristotle further deepened his analysis of the syllogistic consequence by stating in the prior analytics. Here, this we can read there. A true conclusion may be derived from false, false premises, the book two. From opposite premises, contrary or contradictory, a valid conclusion, but he claims this valid conclusion must be a negative conclusion, may be derived in specific moods of the second and third figures. These results are the basis for some of the rules for the evaluation <coughs> of valid syllogisms, justify some consequences in medieval logic, and are at the center of the debate on the ex falso sector quadrilibet in the medieval period. Recently, based on some excerpt, Prince, in a paper of 205, affirms that the syllogistic is per consistent. He affirms. But the earliest suggestion of this is that of Da Costa and Otavio Bueno in a paper published in 1998. And in, a, uh, in chapter 11 of book A of posterior analytics, Aristotle shows that the principle of non-contradiction is not a general presupposition for any demonstration, whatever, but only for those in which the conclusion must be proved on its basis. In a paper of 2010, <coughs> with my co-author, Gomez, we have showed that it is possible to interpret the Aristotelian demonstration in the posterior analytics in contemporary terms, formalizing it in the process paraconsistent logic, uh, first order paraconsistent logic, C1 stuff. Okay, and then we have showed from a technical, syntactical point of view that uh, we can show that Aristotle is paraconsistent Lato sense based on a logic introduced by Newton Lacoste. 
It seems possible to interpret the syllogisms on the basis of opposite premises, as in a broad and consistent theory according to contemporary point of view. We suggest in our work that the role of Aristotle in the prehistory of a consistent logic seems to be much more important than is customarily admitted. Uh, according to our analysis, in some excerpts, Aristotle affirms the possibility of dealing with contradictory premises without having problem, problem uh, at, on account of the principle of non-contradiction. And he claims that in certain cases, we can use our rationality based on contradictory premises. And we have to study this, we have this in the paper. Okay? The ex falso and Stoichnevaric logic. The correct criterion for the relation followed by underlying conditional propositions was a matter of a great controversy among the historians. Uh, <clears throat> one colleague from Brazil wrote us that he, he thinks that we can, in fact, we may uh, 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 identify some kind of consistency in the historic megaric logic. But for us, our conclusion is that the remaining fragments of ancient Stoa do not endorse the conclusion that they start to have a consistent distance. Okay, let's go to medieval authors. <coughs> we present, based on some key authors of the medieval period, considerations and results related to contradiction and to the ex falso sector of body event that they are pertinent to a history of consistent logic. Poesius, in the 5th, uh, 6th century, left seminal elements for the various positions for and against the ex falso that are found in the scholastic phase of medieval logic. Boesius attracted the attention because of a passage that was very important in the conceptual construction of the ex falso. Boesius concisely describes Aristotle's steps in the first chapters of the book B of Prior Analytics, the ones I mentioned, analyzing the case in which a syllogism can have two false premises and a true conclusion. Okay. The translation by Boesius of Aristotle's works was the basic, the basic test is studied by the scholastic. One sees in the era of scholastic logic an intense debate on the validity of the ex falso at the center of doctrine of topics, theories of implication, and duties, disputes. The first writers to mention the ex falso sector quadrilibit or ex impossibile sector quadrilibit were Gagnando Concordista in the 11th century and Peter Abelard. Okay, we have studied the, the, the works by Concordista and Abelard. Uh, <coughs> Concordista is mentioned by some very important uh, uh, researchers as the first one to mention the ex falso. But we tried to look at, it, at uh, his work in Latin, and until now, we didn't find where he mentioned the ex falso. We asked for the, this American professor, and he said, yes, I mentioned, but I have not found, not yet. <laughs> okay, he wrote, <laughs> he, he mentioned his work, but in fact, he has not found the mention. There is a discussion, but not explicitly mentioned. And until now, I will show you that the discussion we have found is in Pedro Belardo, but we are not sure that you can mention that he, he used the terms ex falso sequitur quadrilibit. But these were so, uh, so present in the following years of the medieval times that it seems that the terms had, had been used by one of them. Uh, uh, we think that by Pedro Belar. 
The first writers to mention are so Garlando and Peter Abelard. From the 13th century, there was intense debate concerning the validity of cell form sequences <laughs> that were later accepted. And one finds the peril over the legitimacy of the ex -house. It is in the context of topical inferences and maximal propositions that the rejection of the exhaust by Abelard is evident. He discusses it very much and he finishes uh, uh, exclaiming that it is not acceptable, this principle. Uh, his topical investigation leads Abelard to propose a new semantic criteria for the notion of a necessary consequence, because consecutio necessitas, understood by some medieval authors in the manner of contemporary material implication. Abelard suggests that it was very difficult to study Abelard's papers. Some of them are not translated into <coughs> English, and uh, <laughs> some translations into Spanish, when we are using that, I said to Evander Gomez, my, my student, it's not acceptable. Yeah. And so we decided to use the original Latin versions. And there was a mistake of a preposition translated from Latin to Spanish. Uh, and this mistake had changed the meaning. And so we decided to use the Latin versions. Abelard suggests that a stricter notion of consecutio is necessary. He says, the antecedent of a true declarative conditional sentence requires the consequent intrinsically. This is a contemporary, relevant, logical approach. He says it must have a interaction, interrelation between the premises and the consequence. And so he knew then the problem of material as Aristotelian material education. For Abelard, the ex falso is not valid. And from the false and the, from the impossible, any consequent or whatever does not truly follow. Relevant and by consistent elements seem to orient Abelard's logical option. Here are Abelard, here he is. Okay. <laughs> More opponents of the exhaustion. Some other medieval authors of the 13th century objected to the exhaustion. The veto on the exhaustion can be placed within the panorama of a metaphysical, logic, epistemological approach of a consistent character. Uh, the question for medieval authors was not logic, was theology, was metaphysics. Uh, some of the important opponents of the exhaust, I have no time to, to, to stay here, he is Robert of the Melun, with the Melunensis, Petrus Hispanus, William of Ockham, and Henry of Kent. Petrus Hispanus, the unique Portuguese papa of the history of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. have very, uh, left very important <coughs> papers, and he claimed, according to Peter Abelard, maybe independently, that it's not acceptable, the ex <coughs> That it's necessary to have some interrelation between the meaning of the consequent uh, relative to the antecedent. Okay? Positions formable to the ex also in the scholastic logic. John of Salisbury in the 12th century attributes to Adam of Baltham the thesis that from a contradiction follows the same, even as ex contradiction. A thesis which implies the ex falso, which generalizes it. <laughs> and so, John of Salisbury attributes to Adam of Bauschen. At the beginning of the 20th century, the ex falso was attributed to John Duns Scotus, because a clear and proficient statement of this logical law is found in two of his commentaries. Everybody has read in some book uh, the, the law of ex falso as the law of Domus Scotus. I think I have studied so. <coughs> However, based 
on an examination of the material initiated around, around 1936 by Lompré. These works were attributed to another author whose name is unknown and he's known as Pseudoscotus. This new viewpoint was sanctioned by the Vatican edition of Scotus Opera Omnia that began to be published in 1950. His understanding of the issue has prevailed to the present day. Lukashevich, the great philosopher and logician of the 20th century, in 1951, and so one year after the publication by the Vatican, not having taken into account these revisions in his celebrated study of the Aristotelian synergies, promulgated the hypothesis that the ex also that he called the Love Duns Scotus, should be attributed to the Dr. Subtilis, the known uh, by whom uh, Duns Scotus is known. Due to the prestige of the great Polish logician and historian, this eponymous solution was replicated by numerous other scholars. Till Scotus is one of the most intriguing intriguing personalities in the history of logic. Wise and talented, he developed in an extremely elegant way various logical theories typical of his period. Although Pseudoscotus was not the first to enunciate to Lex Falso, was for some time during or even admitted as such. The argumentation of the author explains in part the merit, the merit achieved by his expo this exposition Aside from the expulsion, some of its corollaries are stated in his conclusions. As may be seen at this point, in the development of medieval logic, the expulsion had been completely integrated into the well-developed theory of the consequence, as we found it in Pseudoscotus. The elegance of his treatment by Pseudoscotus attests to the very major development of the logical classical paradigm. In this case, in detriment to other perspectives, such as those of relevance and her consistency. There are several uh, suppositions about the identity of Pseudoscotus. For instance, Lorenzo Peña, I don't know if uh, no, a Spanish logician, he claims that Pseudoscotus uh, must be Juan uh, de Cantuaria, John of Canterbury. But, uh, no, not Canterbury, Cantuaria in English. Juan of uh, Juan de Cantuaria. Pero are also, there are also uh, claims against this. Uh, other authors are mentioned as possibly being Silvio uh, uh, Scotus, but you don't know who was he, him. And, but his work is very, uh, beautiful, and uh, his work brings uh, a, 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 a plain discussion about the principle and claiming for the acceptance of the principle. And so it's on account of Silvio Scott's works that the classical, Aristotelian classical paradigm was fixed at the end of the medieval times. Uh, to the extent that logical classical citizenship may be considered to the rule, there is a logical classical solution to the conflict. On the other hand, in rejecting the ex and the cl logical classical solution to the phenomenon of contradiction, various authors have delineated an alternative approach, which encompasses elements pertinent to the paradigm, paradigm now known as paradigm system. Modern authors, are more easily brought to accept as decisive the methodological criterion of logical classical coinage, according to which any inconsistencies or contradictions inevitably bring to the rational theory in which they occur to falsity, to triviality. This predominance in the modern period will only be definitively reconsidered with the advent of contemporary power consistency. And here we have Jaskowski, Aida Huda, the first collaborator of Milton Acosta. Both were my teachers. 
<laughs> and here is a very beautiful book I published after Ali Dahuda death on Vasilev logic in Portuguese. The context of logic in the modern era is in fact philosophically complex and formally poor. The sparse logical formal elements cultivated in uh, the 16th and 17th Europe reflect these distinct medieval logic traditions. Modern scholars, famous for their contributions to philosophy, incorporate very little formal logic in their theoretical elaborations. Uh, analyzing the inconsistency by some modern authors, in our work we have discussed Leibniz's positions, Christian Wolf positions. It's very distinct because Leibniz is an icon of a classical position. But there are authors like Marcelo Gascal, who is one of the, uh, the great uh, linguistics and one of the most important researchers on Leibniz. He claims that there are excepts in Leibniz. There is a paper by him and a student where he calls that Leibniz says that sometimes it is possible to deal with contradiction with, <clears throat> without triviality. And he calls this soft rationality. Leibniz. Okay, but he's an icon of classical <coughs> thinking. Uh, we have studied in our book Immanuel Kant and David Hume positions, and if we can find something non-classical in Kant, it would be as an intuitionistic position, not a paraconsistent position. Okay, we call attention in our work to Hegel's position and contribution to rehabilitating the role of contradiction in knowledge, reopening the philosophic trail so that other theoreticians could seriously consider the role of contradiction in broad rational contexts. At the beginning of the 20th century, Particular importance must be attributed to the rebirth of the study of logic, metaphysics, and ontology, the foundations of mathematics and science, especially in Central Europe. The mathematical environment of the 19th century is notable, above all, for the advent of non Euclidean geometries, motivating a similar attitude in logic and facilitating the creative freedom that is so characteristic of logical contributions of the 20th century, which have shown themselves to be extremely fruitful, especially in relation to non-classical logics. Jan Ukashevich, at the beginning of the 20th century, is one of the great names of contemporary logic, and the importance of his contributions is recognized by various scholars of the present day in logic as well as in philosophy. Bukashevich employs his analysis of the principle of non-contradiction and ends by concluding that it is logically dispensable. In 1910, Bukashevich published a very beautiful book in Polish and a paper in German titled On the Principle of Non-Contradiction. He discusses all the, uh, all the Aristotle's arguments in favor of the principle of non-contradictions and concludes that all of them are not acceptable. And he concludes that the principle is logically dispensable, may be dispensable. In this sense, the Polish scholar clearly sees the path to a project for non-Aristotelian logics in which the later principle no longer holds. The conclusions directly influence the appearance of the first consistent logical system, especially within the Polish school of logic. Nikolai Vasilev, a physician, a, a Russian physician and philosopher, defended a bold non classical logical theoretic project with original ideas and suggestions. In 1912, he outlines an explicit project of alternative, heterodox non-classical logics. His ideas united 
the paraconsistent, many valued, and intentional approaches. I presented a paper I was written, but it, it has been punched in one of the meetings of the Mexican Academy of Science, I believe in Guadalajara, where uh, I discussed these papers by Vasily, showing him as a forerunner of non classical logic in general, and especially of the consistent logic. But he has not presented a formal system. Other scholars will realize the plans of Fukashevich and Vasilyev. The mathematical milieu of the 19th century and the advent of mathematical logic at the beginning of the 20th century, with its appropriate tools, made these steps possible, firm, and successful. As a consequence of all historiographic premises, we consider Stanislaw Yashkoski and Dilton da Costa is still alive. He, he is completing 90 years this year. We are organizing a beautiful event because he continues working too much. Nowadays, he works on the foundations of quantum <coughs> mechanics. The creators of consistent logic, motivated by problems arising from the presence of contradictions in specific rational contexts, they proposed and developed axiomatic logical systems capable of dealing with contradictions and inconsistencies without a trivialization of the implied theories. Stanislaw Yashkoski, motivated, he was uh, Ukashevich's student, and he was motivated by Ukashevich's works. Uh, motivated by Hegelian and Marxist interpretations of contradiction, <coughs> introduced it in two papers, one of 1948 and the second in 1949. He introduced his largely known as the largely D2, known as discursive or discursive logic, which tolerates contradiction. The motivation for this logic derives from the fact that the presence of contradictory statements in ordinary language is common, and the use of contradictory hypotheses is often necessary for the explanation of phenomena in scientific theories. Newton Acosta, but the papers, the two papers published by Nyaskosh were published in Polish, and they were unknown until 1969, when they were published translated in English, or uh, an abstract in English was published by the Journal of Symbolic Logic. Newton da Costa, in 63, is very clear in proposing his hierarchies of paraconsistent logics as alternative axiomatic logical systems, developing as well logics of a higher order that are able to overcome the limitations that contradictions impose on rational theories in the logical classical paradigm. In this context, aside from the fact that the and Yashkovsky fit the criteria of intentional and semantic consistency, the contributions of these two authors call the attention of the community of logicians to a new investigative program which delineated little by little the shape of the present day field of consistent logic. The initial proposals for consistent systems encourage many scholars to study consistency in its variety of forms, including those arising from relevance <coughs> logics, modal logics, fuzzy logics, and others. And these have been pursued by researchers of various nationalities and continents, especially in Belgium, Australia, Italy, Russia, Israel, and the United States. Da Costa, his disciples <coughs> and collaborators from several countries have introduced many consistent systems and obtained relevant results. Uh, after knowing the Da Costa's papers, because they began being published in 1963, Yashkoshkin maintained contact with Newton Da Costa and uh, 
uh, Newton, when Newton went to Poland, Jaszkowski had died. But uh, I remember when I began studying logic, several Polish students, uh, Jaszkowski students, went to my university to work with Acosta. And the development of Jaszkowski's uh, logics and the theories were obtained in, uh, by Jaszkowski's students in collaboration with Newton da Costa. And then he received the, the Nicolau Copernic Medal from the Senate of Poland in 1999 on account of his close collaboration with Polish logicians and of the importance of their uh, interrelated work. Uh, uh, the causes group has obtained relevant results on algebraic structures associated to consistent systems. We have developed several consistent set theories, model theory, logics of higher order, and consistent differential calculus. Theories based uh, uh, among the applications of consistent logics, we have theories based on semantically closed language, applications to ethics, to other non classical logics, to the theory of probability. My colleagues in the Center for Logic nowadays work on uh, a very consistent theory of probability, foundations of the infinitesimal calculus, foundation of quantum mechanics. Applications to computer science, to cognitive science, and to translations and combinations of logic. Our consistency has become a field of knowledge interrelating distinct schools of paraconsistent logic, interrelating English is together, there is not discussion. Distinct schools of paraconsistent logic, and there are applications of paraconsistent logic not only to the foundations of science and its philosophical analysis, but even to informatics and technology. Uh, the first uh, uh, groups to, to, to introduce applications to technology were, uh, was uh, in Japan. They introduced uh, uh, applications for washing machines, for telephone systems, and for the control of um, uh, airport traffic, uh, persistent logic has been used. And we have some persistent robots also nowadays. Newton says that he has the idea how to construct computers based on persistent logic. He told me that I don't know <laughs> which are the ideas. <laughs> The consistency has become a field of knowledge, okay. And on account of this, we have a very well established Brazilian school of logic, very well known. <coughs> Here is Newton da Costa, with Desio Krause, a very important, this is very young, is Jonas. Jonas. Jonas, Jonas, okay? Jonas, Arendt. Jonas Arendt. Arendt. Hmm? Arendt. Yes. Uh, here is Arida Arruda. He was very young when Newton da Costa worked in Curitiba and they worked together. She was the first collaborator, but she died very, very young, with 45 years, and she left a very important example. Uh, It's precisely from this perspective that we have studied the initial and general development of persistent logic with an <coughs> emphasis on the history of Newton da Costa's persistent systems, as well as his contributions to the inauguration of this field of logic in the 20th century. Uh, the result of this initial research is a book purchased after 13 years of work with my ex PhD student nowadays a colleague his professor at a university in Brazil and the book was purchased by the Coleção Clé 
of the Centre for Logic as the volume 80 of the collection, and a joint publication by the Unicamp University Press. Unicamp um, uh, has completed 50 years in uh, uh, 2016, and the university has published a special series of 50 books commemorating its 50 years. The series, Unicamp Annual 50 Series. And this is the volume 80 of Coleção Clé and the volume 50 of the Unicamp Special Series. Okay, uh, it was published in Portuguese, and we have a volume to. When we were publishing the book, the editor uh, ah, the name of the book is Para Além das Colunas de Hercules, Uma História da Paraconsistência, de Herácio e do Anildo da Costa. O que means? Para Além de das Colunas de Hercules, Mas Allá. Mas Allá de das Colunas de Hercules, Uma História da Paraconsistência, de Herácio e do Anildo da Costa. Uh, the title is an allusion to the epic metaphor of surpassing limits such as the founders of our consistent have made transcending classical limits of logicity. When Newton da Costa published his first papers, he called the, the, logic as, uh, uh, the logics of inconsistent, uh, the, the, theories inconsistent and not trivial. Pero uh, Pablo Miró Quesada, uh, Peruvian philosopher, uh, we have at the Center for Logical an account of our research. A correspondence between Newton da Costa and Pablo Miroquezad, Newton asked Miroquezad, could you suggest me a good name for the logics inconsi for inconsistent but non trivial, uh, uh, trivial theories? And Pablo answered, we have the lecture, suggesting three names Meta paraconsistentes, que seria arriba de la paraconsistencia. Um, Meta para consistente, um, ultra, algo como ultra consistentes, and para consistentes. And Newton accepted, liked it very much, para, because Pablo Miroquezada suggested, para may be understood as a Latin or a Greek prefix. And you, you could understand, uh, para más allá de la consistencia, o al lado de la consistencia. E Miró Quezada wrote, Newton, porque tu has, después de 24 siglos, tido la osadía de ultrapassar las columnas de Hércules. Y ahí le pusimos en el título. Pero cuando el libro estaba para ser publicado, el editor de Santes Library, que es una de las publicaciones más importantes, de la lógica y filosofía, la historia y filosofía de la ciencia, wrote us and invited <coughs> us to publish a translation of the book, a translation to English of the book. The, it was accepted, we have firmed the contract, and the book will appear probably at the end of this year, and the title will be A Illuminating Contradiction, A History of Paraconsistence from Heraclitus of Ephesus to Newton Post. And nowadays we are working because the, the book his book has 700 pages, but the English book will have for about 1,000 pages. <laughs> we have a... a, 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 a <laughs> How much will it cost? <laughs> it will be very expensive. We have a special part at the end with interviews given by the most important but consistent logicians of the 20th century. Like, for instance, Dieter Wattens, Anoa Vron, um, Graham Bridge, um, Subramanian. From Mexico, we are waiting for the interview by Henry Morado. He's not here. We have to send him the interview. <laughs> and we have some Brazilian, Latin American, Italian, Russian logician. And so we'll have a special part at the end of the book. 
Ok? Thank you. Gracias.